Ro from Nerdy Nummies. Mm. She's got a question. Oh. Hi, I'm Rosanna Pancino. And Neil, first question, when are you going to come bake with me again? Second question, what is your favorite star constellation and why? Ooh, very nice. Yeah. So she, what she hinted at, I was on her show. Ah. I helped her bake a cake. Nice. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. And how was the cake? Never ate it. <laughs> tell, tell the <laughs> I'm truth. I'm trying to remember. Because ne- it was more fun making it. Well, right. It's the journey. <laughs> 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 uh, on Nerdy Nummies. Nerdy and Nummies. Yeah, it was very fun to be on her show. And she wants to know when I'm coming back. Right. When are you but, coming back? You don't call. You don't text. You know, I'm, I'm here. Mm-hmm. I'm here. But anyway, what is your favorite constellation? So my favorite constellation. And why? Is Orion. Ooh, Orion. Orion the Hunter. Uh-huh. First, he sort of looks like what he's supposed to be. Kind of, yeah. He's, he's got a belt, yep. his uh, shoulders, his kneecaps. Right. There's a shield. He's got a shield. He's defending himself against Taurus the bull. Right. He's right up above above him, off to the side. And so he kind of looks like what he's supposed to be. Unlike the other 87 constellations, maybe about five of them resemble what they're supposed to be. Leo. Yeah. Is one of them Scorpius? Is another Scor- they, yeah. that looks Scorpius like a scorpion? Looks like that, yeah. It looks like a scorpion. It's got a stinger. But you look at things like Gemini, yeah, or Pisces. Yeah. Or, First of all, you're stretching it. Those are some ugly twins. <laughs> if that's Gemini, <laughs> <laughs> so most don't look like you need no. seriously enhanced imagination to to get that. So of the 88 constellations, Orion is, smokes the rest in terms of its what it looks like, what it's supposed to be. In addition, the celestial equator, so take Earth's equator and project it out onto the sky. Correct. So what that means is, do that again. So what that means, yeah, I didn't need the sound effects, <laughs> fine. Okay, so what that means is, all the part of the sky above that sit above the northern hemisphere right. of the Earth, and the sky below that sits above the southern hemisphere. Gotcha. Orion. Oh, I gotta keep it. Flanks the oh! north and the south, so everybody gets a piece of Orion. Oh, exactly! It's the ecumenical <laughs> equatorial constellation. It's the equatorial constellation. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. So no, that's that, that's that's very cool. Yeah. So uh, a little known fact here: when we re- renovated the Hayden Planetarium, mm-hmm. I just floated the idea. Don't you know? Don't judge me. I floated the idea that we might update all the constellations. The things that matter to us today. Oh, so if it's going to be Orion the Hunter, it's going to be Orion like the 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 butcher. The, no, no. <laughs> no, Orion is like a like a like a warrior. I mean, he can right. fight. So we get one of one Orion of the, the Predator drone. <laughs> no, the Predator. Dr- <laughs> Orion the Predator drone. <laughs> <laughs> or just just the Predator, right? From the the movie. Predator, right. right? Right? No, just some hunter, some modern day hunter. Exactly. And <laughs> other constellations like Pegasus. You know, that's the upside down flying half a white horse in the sky. Right. In case you never, in case you missed that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, actually, has a box of stars that looks very much like a baseball diamond. So that would be just the baseball. Flag. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. The baseball so I, I, constellation. I had this idea. It lasted about three minutes in right. committee, and then we went on to other things. Yeah. I like the idea of renaming the constellations, though. Yeah, just to give it updates. Yeah, no centaurs anymore. Yeah, and you know? what? And, and also, it'd be a great way to get kids like interested exactly. in looking up. No, I said no centaurs anymore, like there ever once. I was about to but, say, but, I, you know, okay, I, okay, okay. However, in my mind, there were centaurs. Okay, no, no, at no but one today point. we have other stuff that doesn't exist that exists. Right, like minotaurs. Like, like. <laughs> <laughs> no, we no. have, we have, um, like, um, what do we have? We have characters from The Walking Dead. You know, we have zombies. Zombies. Yeah, zombies. Right. right. They exist but don't exist. Exactly. Right. Okay. Right. We have Zena. Is she still not Zena, the the warrior princess? Uh, yeah. Throw her up yes. there. Get put put some of her up there. All right. Put put Captain Marvel up there. Put Superman up there. There's other culture that we care about today. That's I all like, I'm saying. Cool. You know what we could do? What? There are enough shapes of stars up there. Maybe there could be a nerdy nummy cookie logo. As you know, that would be the best advertisement <laughs> ever. I'm just saying. <laughs> the nerdy nummies. The nerdy in the nummies and th- of the cosmos. <laughs> well, anyway, Ro, I can't wait to get back on your show. Thanks for that question. So, Ro, you got more questions? Bring it on. 
what is the closest planet to me that is most similar to Earth, and when can I go there? Ooh. Oh, okay. So here's the thing. The closest planet to Earth, that is the planet that gets the closest, because everybody's doing their, their thing. Right. And sometimes they're over there and it's you're over right, here. Right, exactly. So you want to check it out when everybody's on the same side of the sun. The planet that comes closest to us is Venus. Wow. And the goddess of love and beauty. Oh, yeah. that's so romantic. It is. The, exactly. goddess, the goddess of love and beauty for the planet. That, okay, but the planet is 900 degrees. That's what I was going to say. It's like, the well, actually, that is kind of love would, and beauty in a nutshell. You be vaporized. There you go. <laughs> that's love in that's my life. life. That's how love ends. That's how love ends. All love ends that way. Vaporization. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so it's, it's a runaway greenhouse effect with a very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere. Note to earthlings, Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. There you it's go. It's 900 degrees. So that's the closest but it's not the most like Earth. What you really want is the next closest. Okay. Which is, so if Venus is on one side of us, on the inside of us, between us and the sun, just on the outside of us is Mars. Mars, right. Mars. A little farther, but mm. we can get there. Yeah. We've been there. Right. We, so we got probes, ro rovers there now. Right. Okay. So Mars rotates once in about 24 hours. Nice. It's tipped on its axis. Nice. Which means it has seasons. There you go. It has polar ice caps. Look at that. We at, we still do for now. Right. Have polar ice caps. Call your travel agent. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> what are we doing? So, Why so are we still but here? it's still hostile to life. Right. All right. There's ultraviolet radiation from the sun that's not shielded by the ozone in an atmosphere. So it sterilizes ultraviolet and life don't play well together in the sandbox. Right. The high energy ultraviolet photons break apart molecules that are organic. So you, you, they don't mix. They don't so mix. you wanna, if there's life, it's under the surface, or if there ever wants life, it would have needed this kind of protection, life as we know it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would be Mars. Now how soon can she get there? She could sign up to be the first astronaut class to make on cookies. Mars. On making Ma cookies. <laughs> first astronaut making cookies on Mars, girl. <laughs> <laughs> cookies, you can make cookies fast. Cookies are fast anyway in the well, oven. You ever make cookies in yeah, the oven? Yeah, of course. They're one of the fastest things you can make. Yeah. You know why? Because even at high temperature, they're thin enough. That's right. So that the heat doesn't have to wait a long time to get to the middle. Right. Atom by atom communicating. You would end up burning the outside and the inside wouldn't get cooked. So thin, <laughs> Which is, by the way, how all my cookies come out. <laughs> so thin, flat things can cook in very high temperature gradients. Right. So if she wanted to cook a cake on Venus... You burn the outer surface and the inside wouldn't, wouldn't even get touched. Mm. But if you want to bake cookies on Venus, seconds. Put it Boom. out there on the windowsill. Right, and it's done. Done. It's like, Cook a pizza, done. Put it out. By pull, the time, it pull it in. Pull it in. There go. you go. There you go. Nice. So, But not Mars. Mars is several hundred degrees below zero. Oh. Yeah. See, you know what I'm learning from this conversation? What? Earth is really cool. <laughs> it is good to be Earth. here. It is a good. I used to say Saturn is my favorite planet, but it's really Earth. Yeah, Saturn is my second favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for that question, Ro. Are we ever going to have a space elevator? Ooh, I am not familiar with the term space elevator. It's because you're not as geeky as Ro is. Oh, Ro is on the on the case. She's on the case, huh? On the case. She knows the deal. She knows the deal. What is a space elevator? Even though it's name. Show's name Nerdy Nummies. Nerdy Nummies. It's, it's like it should just be nerdy. Nerdy, <laughs> nerdy everything. Nerdy everything. 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 Uh, so space elevator. Here's how it works. You ready? Go ahead. There's such cost launching you into orbit. Right. All right. You need the rocket. You need the launch pad. You need all of this. Mm -hmm. You got to get up to eighteen thousand miles. And this is like, what are we There's doing? There's a lot going on there. A lot going on. There. Right. Okay. Did you know that the farther away from Earth you orbit? This will make sense when I say it. The longer it takes to complete an orbit. That makes sense. Okay. It's like a record player. Like a well, no, the entire record it moves mo at the same time. It takes the same time. Okay. Right. So it's not like a record player. No, I'm saying it's, when you're it's exactly not like a record player. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All parts of a record complete um, one at, at the, the same, same time. time. Right. Whereas orbits, the outer orbit travels slower and takes longer to complete an orbit. Right. So just above Earth's surface takes about 90 minutes. So low Earth orbit is close enough takes about 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Space shuttle, 90 minute orbit. Go higher, it can take two hours. Mm -hmm. A little higher, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours. There is a distance that you could put a satellite in orbit where it takes 24 hours to orbit the Earth. Okay. 
So what does that mean? It means if you put a satellite up at that orbit, it stays with you. As All the way around. It is always hovering right. above your spot. I have the best cell phone service <laughs> ever. This was the idea put forth by Arthur C. Clarke. 1947, was it? 46, just after the Second World War. He thought that if you put a satellite at that distance, which is about 23,000 miles up, you could park one over the Atlantic between Europe and the United States and beam communication signals. Right. He came up with the idea of the communication satellite. Nice. So that <clears throat> ring around the Earth is filled with communication satellites because we know, all know about this. Now, wait a minute. If it hovers above a spot, let's put a platform there, a space platform, a space station. Okay. And dangle a, a rope and just put an elevator there. <laughs> and just take the elevator take the up to the space. Take the elevator instead of the you don't 18, have to g- pounds of fuel and all. <laughs> Wait, so what you do you don't do? have to gain speed to have orbit to sustain orbit in low earth. Just orbit. give a yank. No, 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 you don't want to yank it cuz <laughs> leave that up there. Right. But just you have an elevator. I'm saying to let them know to pull you up. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd have more sophisticated <laughs> ways. Kink, <laughs> kink, I'm ready. This is not a treehouse with a bell <laughs> attached. No, we got sophisticated ways right. of like, okay, let me up. Or or, or some kind of room. Where you, now, it would take a long time to go 20, 23,000 miles. That's a long way. It's a long way. You need, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a friend of mine who composed music called Space Elevator Music. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she, uh, she, has, she, uh, she composes music uh, under the name Zia, and uh, her name is Elaine Walker. She's got a whole album called Space, Space Elevator, Elevator Music. Just, just in time to keep you busy for 23,000 mile <laughs> trip. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, oh, so uh, problem is we know of no material that is strong enough to even hold up its own weight in cable dangling below such a, sta- a space station. Wow. Much less than attach an elevator to it to ride up. Though there is a substance that can do it. What is it? Okay. Do you remember buckyballs? No. This is carbon, a new form of carbon, carbon 60. Take 60 carbon atoms and they make a sphere that is are all the nodes that are on the classical uh, soccer ball. Okay. It's very cool. Right. And it makes a, a round thing. Right. Okay. And it turns out you can cut it in the middle and extend it also with carbon atoms and make a a, a bucky tube. All right. It's hollow, but it's okay. This is really, really strong. It is strong enough to hold up its own weight. The problem is generating these things. And last I checked, I'm, I don't have the latest on this, but right. the last I checked, the longest we've made, the longest tube we've made, because these are a, on a molecular scale, is about a centimeter. About a centimeter, right? So we got a ways to go. Yeah. So only, uh, you know, twenty-two thousand <laughs> nine hundred <laughs> nine 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 point so nine 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 yeah. miles to go. So, Ro, we are far away technologically from making a space elevator, but the idea continues to tantalize those who want. Uh, easy access to space, easy and cheap access mm-hmm. to space going forward. So we're not there yet. I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. By the way, the day we perfect carbon, they're called nanotubes. Right. That would transform construction. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Because it's really light and really strong, that, yeah. way stronger than steel. Right. You can make really tall, tall, b- tall skyscrapers. buildings that don't weigh anything. And they so wouldn't even need the foundation. Structurally, you don't have to, be, that's right. Wow. Exactly. That's pretty cool. You just got to watch out. You don't want people just pushing them over. I was going to say. <laughs> you do want to anchor them down so much. <laughs> Chuck. That's pretty cool. I just want to see the person who gets stuck in the space elevator. Oh. You know? Oh, yeah. We're coming for you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go, Ro. Why is Star Trek the best show ever made? And why is Voyager the best season? He disagrees. I think he likes a different season. But we're still friends because we both love Star Trek. Yeah, she got that right. Okay, she yeah. She got that right. Well, I'm with you, too, if you disagree that Voyager is not the best, because it's not. <laughs> Ob- objectively. Objectively, it's I'm just saying. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> uh, it could be, when did you come of age? Right? Yeah. You know, there, well, I, there's a Star Trek at every 
turning point. Correct. People, you know, the 60s, and then I think I think we have to wait to the 80s. So I'm next generation. So, yeah, there's ne- ne- next gen. Star, Star Trek next gen. Yeah, but then after Patrick that is Stewart, Patrick you know. Stewart. That's right. Number one. <laughs> Engage. I love it. <laughs> Warp one and yeah, right. Yes. How does he have? He's he's got a French name, right? With a British accent, and right? He, and he's sixty, but he has the body Rise of a twenty-year-old. Of, yeah, I'm what? Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> captain of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> What's I'm, up with that? I'm actually forty-two years old. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. So so uh, so she got me right to where I think deeply about this. Right. So I'm a fan of the first season. First. I, I'm old enough. Well, everybody has to be a fan of the first season. You don't have no, no. Yeah, all, no. Oh, no. you're not a true fan. I mean, you may not I, like I, it I, best, I, okay, but, it's, but I'm it's not going to hold judgment on the people. Okay, the Borg was a great idea. That was you awesome. know, and the visor on right. on Jordy. Jordy. The, yeah, there's some good stuff happened later. Right. We finally got Janeway, get a female right. captain on there. So, so uh, the stuff had to happen later on. What I'm saying is, in the original season. As was carried through, that spaceship, A, the USS Enterprise, was the first ship that I know of, and I've looked at, that was not designed just to go to another place, but was simply conceived to explore. explore. That's right. Every other spaceship and every other sci-fi thing right. was, okay, we're using this we're to go to Mars. To a destination. And then it's, and it shows right. about being on Mars. This was just made to seek out and discover new, new life, life new, new civilizations. civilizations. Right. To boldly, boldly go, go where, where no, no person, person, no person, person has gone before. And if you're going to correct the grammar, it'd be to go boldly. Right. No split infinitives. Exactly. As your mama would say if she were here. Absolutely. So, so I like the fact that it, pioneered a new understanding of what it is to be in space. A. B. The captain actually fought his own fights. Yes, he did. Okay. And he beamed down on every away mission. Every He beamed down and right. would fight. And you can't expect your crew to fight unless you're going to fight too. I just right. thought that was not that fighting is a good thing. I'd rather no one fought, but if you got to fight, you don't send someone else to do your fighting. That's right. Okay? He went down there to fight, but he also made sure that he was always going to bring a black crewman who he knew would die. <laughs> <laughs> no, the crewman just had to have a red shirt. That's true. Whether or not the skin or not, was dark. That's okay. true. That's true. That's, that's true. a red shirt. That's true. Okay. You're right. C, every show was a morality tale. True. And I just thought, who, who's doing this? Maybe Twilight Zone at the time. Yeah. But otherwise, those three things combined made the original Star Trek, for me, one of the greatest mirrors to our own civilization that has ever been put up. Under the guise of, oh, this is just science fiction. You get to learn about yourself without knowing that, in fact, the lesson is being infused through your eyes and ears. Who is that in the mirror? <laughs> Who is that in the mirror? <laughs> Neil. <laughs> so that's my answer. So I don't, I'm not going to fight anybody who has a f- more favorite season than the first one. Uh-huh. But I just want to say the first one was groundbreaking in all those fundamental ways. So there you go. Okay. I, listen, I'll accept that. So, so there you have it. Star Trek, first generation. <laughs> 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 Captain Kirk. Oh, plus. Plus, right. Captain Kirk would use seat of his pants reasoning. I like that. Right, and Spock was always there to let him know that everything he was doing was illogical. Illogical. Right. It means Kirk would beat Spock at poker every time. That's basically <laughs> it. They didn't play the game, but right. this is like, you've got a bluff. I know how to bluff. Exactly. I know how to, right, and you don't. All right. <laughs> One of my favorite episodes of Star Trek from the original series. Go ahead. Okay, you ready? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the details, and real aficionados would like know chapter and verse. Okay. But here it is. There's some enemy vessel out the front window. Right. Okay? And Kirk's shields have a problem coming back up, and so they're kind of susceptible. Okay? hmm And Kirk tells Uhura... Open a channel. Open a channel. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Open a channel to Starfleet Command. Use the... The secure channel 3156, okay? Tell them we are going to execute executive order, whatever. Right, right. So here's the thing. That channel, that secure channel, 
has been decoded right. by the enemy. Right, and they know that. And, okay, all right. And but the enemy doesn't think that Spock that, that Kirk knows this. And this executive order is self destruct of the ship, which would end also destroy the ship that's ready to attack them. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so Spock hears this and knows that that channel's already been compromised and said, uh, Captain, you realize that's no longer a secure channel. This is no time for a game of chess. And he says to Spock, Spock, this I am is not, not playing chess. <laughs> I said, Spock, this is not chess. This is poker. This and is I said, poker. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> yeah. You're staring somebody down and you bluff. Right. And they don't know you're bluffing. Right. And you got a really badass bluff. That's You're a sending a secret bluff. message over a decoded channel. Right. That they don't know that uh, you know that is that decoded. That you know that he know that you know. That's right. That's Norton. <laughs> I know that, that you, you know, know that I know, Norton. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that episode. No one under 50 has seen that episode <laughs> of The Honeymooners. So I like the fact that Kirk could use his intuition that would not be anchored in logic to make a decision that was in the interest of the safety of the crew. It sounds to me like Captain Kirk is just very reckless. <laughs> <laughs> Spock was like, wait, are you bluffing? <laughs> like, you, we die. We die, man. You don't get it. <laughs> not a time to bluff. Right, exactly. We, you don't just lose a pot. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Now, I don't mean to brag. I don't mean to brag, but I was quoted on the latest iteration of the Star Trek series. Discovery. Star Trek Discovery on CBS. That's right. I was quoted by Spock. Get out. Yes, yes, I was. I'm just saying. I don't mean to brag. Okay. So here it was. It's like Spock is having this moment of existential angst, and you're hearing his thoughts. Right. And he says, well, do I exist, and how do I exist in a quantum multiverse, and could I? This He's having this moment, okay? And in there he says... As a, I'm paraphrasing, as an ancient earth scientist once said, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to me. Oh my God, I saw that. You did see that? Yes, he did yeah, yeah, say yeah. that. So he didn't use my name. I'm just some ancient earth scientist. Right. That's my, that's my quote. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool, So man. I don't mean to brag, but that's what. So Chuck. Yeah. I was on Nerdy Nummy. Oh. Yes. What'd yeah, you do? Ro and I baked a cake. Oh, that's very nice. It was very, very fun. It was inspired by a single episode of Star Trek Voyager. Cool. Oh, yeah. Now, you got to go click on it if you want to see. Yeah. yeah. I want to eat it. <laughs> How do I click on that? <laughs> <laughs> that's the next generation the next internet. Gener <laughs> <laughs> click on it. Bada bang. Rick Cake shows up right there. Anyway, Ro, thanks for those questions. 